Matthew chapter three, and again, I read from the King James version. That is my preferred version um, of Bible reading. And that's fine. If you have another version, that's great. Whatever works for you. All right. Matthew chapter three, starting in verse 11. And this is John the Baptist speaking. Um, the backstory, a little bit on this chapter, John the Baptist was John, he's referred to John the Baptist, because in this chapter, as well as in Luke, he was, um, he was a preacher for, uh, for the Lord, and he was Jesus's cousin as well. And in this particular account, this particular setting, John is baptizing in the River Jordan. So we're going to start here in verse 11. In, bat, in the physical baptizing, he was also preaching a sermon and um, prophesying, telling the people um, about the coming Messiah. He was the forerunner for Jesus Christ as he shares that here in Matthew chapter 3. So. Verse 11, this is John the Baptist speaking here in verse 11. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit and with fire. So John the Baptist is telling them that the, the, the work that he's doing, he's, he is the minister, they are the agents, and the element is the water. And he as the minister, he had, he's administering the baptism ceremony, which is submerging that physical person in the element called water. So he is speaking here in his sermon to them. He is saying, I'm doing this. I be, I'm being the minister, you being the, ag um, the agent, the individual, and the element is the water. I'm going to submerge you into this water. Now he says, there's one who's coming after me. He's making reference to Jesus. He said, who's, who I'm not worthy to bear. He is mightier than I. So we note there that John the Baptist he was already elevating Jesus in the eyes of the hearers. And that's a, that's a true characteristic of humility and in following with the word of God. As Jesus said in John chapter eight, excuse me, John chapter 12, verse 32, I believe it is. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men. So that's exactly what John the Baptist was doing here, even before Jesus actually uttered those words in John chapter 12. He was saying, I'm doing this work as a minister for God, and I'm administering the ceremonial practice of baptism. But there's coming one after me who's mightier or who's greater than I am. Why? Because he's not only going to baptize you in this element called water, but he's going to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. So basically what John was saying is, I'm doing the physical work and the physical work is symbolic to what Jesus wants to do and is going to do in the spiritual. So he's coming after me. He's mightier than I. 
I'm going, he's going to baptize you in the Holy Spirit and with fire. And then he goes on in verse 12 and he says, whose fan, so now he's talking about the Holy Spirit, right? So he shares with us concerning two of the persons of the Godhead, the Son and the Spirit. So he says, he, referring to Jesus, he will do the work that I'm doing, but in the spiritual. He's going to, Jesus being the minister, us, the individual, uh, still being the agent, and now the element is no longer the physical water. The element is the Holy Spirit. So again, in my teaching on baptism, I kind of break that down. The minister in the physical, the minister takes the agent, the person, and baptizes them in the element being the water. In the spiritual, Jesus is the minister. The individual is still the agent. And now the element is the Holy Spirit. So that's what John is breaking down here, <clears throat> letting us know, letting them as well as us know that there's two baptisms, dealing with two baptisms. And really we deal with, we, I have taught three baptisms, uh, but I'll share that at another time. So he says, <clears throat> Jesus will take you, take us and baptize us in the Holy Spirit. So he'll take the natural man and he'll baptize him in the supernatural right? The Holy Spirit, the supernatural, giving us power to, to be able to overcome, triumph, and have victory over our flesh, which is what we battle on a daily basis. So he goes on and he says, he shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So notice here, he says, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with the Holy Spirit comes fire. And that's what I wanna talk about today because there's a purpose for that fire, a purpose. He goes on in verse 12 and he says, whose fan is in his hand, now referring to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit has his fan in his hand and he will thoroughly or completely or thoroughly purge his floor. So he takes the fire and fire does what? Fire purifies. Fire burns out impurities, right? Fire oftentimes is the element that's used to refine, refine something. So using this particular scripture, and then also, let me just read. You can turn to it if you like. First Peter chapter 2, verse 7. The Bible reads, and I'm just going to kind of start right in the middle there. The trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, talking about our faith, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. And then also Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. David, the psalm is writing, he said, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. Verse 24. And see if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way of everlasting. So I want to speak to you about refined by God. Refined by God. Even before uh, we move forward, Let's just look at the word refine for a moment or two. 
the definition of the word refined is to bring to a fine or pure state. Something that is free or something that's being brought to a state of being free from impurities. Another definition is to purify what is coarse and make elegant. The last definition I'll share with you is this, to bring to a finer state or form by purifying or the purification process. So again, refine, define. To bring to a fine or pure state, free from impurities, to purify what is coarse and make elegant. To bring to a finer state or form by purifying. That's the definition or a few definitions for the word refine. When I think about that, I think about, I think about a number of things, but something that maybe many people can relate to. A, a piece of wood. When I was younger, I had wood shop and I, I, I made uh, projects in wood shop and, and projects out of wood at home as well. Well, with that being said, creating or making a project out of wood is a process. The process begins with acquiring or obtaining the piece of wood itself. And oftentimes that piece of wood is, is very raw, it's coarse. So in order, I'm not gonna go through all the details, but just try to highlight, in order to get that piece of wood to look like and to feel like what you want it to, what you want the end result to be, you have to do a refining process on it. Oftentimes, most of the time, in that refining process, we would be given sandpaper. And the sandpaper was uh, the initial piece of sandpaper used was very coarse. And that sand, that coarse sandpaper would begin to um, take out some of the coarse areas, the extremely coarse areas of that piece of wood. Well, in that process, you would start off with one degree of sandpaper, one thickness of sandpaper, a coarseness of sandpaper. And as you're going through the process, you begin to decrease, decrease, and decrease the coarseness on the sandpaper. Why? Because that piece of wood is being refined. That piece of wood is beginning to form or come yes, to form it and come about to where that you can complete your project. So oftentimes I think about that when I think about refining. It's a process. And in that process, you have sandpaper that's going along the grain, oftentimes against the grain in order to remove those rough spots in order to smooth out things, in order to refine, in order to bring to a pure state, a smooth state in the case of wood. Well, let me talk to you about it in the spiritual realm in Christianity, just a moment here. Last week, I shared with you pretty extensively about Isaiah chapter 53, how that what Jesus 
uh, about the crucifixion and why Jesus went through that and how Isaiah prophesied what Jesus went through. And it was for us. It was so that we could become Christians. This word Christian, the Bible tells us in the book of Acts chapter 11, verse 26, the Bible says that they were first called Christians in Antioch. Again, Acts chapter 11, verse 26, I believe it is, they were first called Christians in Antioch. So a number of years had gone by before the followers of Christ were called Christians. The church was born, as it is called, in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, the results at that particular festival was the church was born. There was a spiritual birth of what is known as what we call the church. But truly there were followers, they were followers of Jesus Christ. They were disciples of Jesus Christ. And as they followed Jesus, as they were disciples of Jesus, they lived for Jesus, walked for Jesus, Later on, again, in Acts chapter 11, they were called Christians. As I was told and as I read, they were called Christians, and I'll give you a little bit of history on this here. They were called Christians because it was a custom that whoever you were following you were called by that name, such as if a person was a Roman, uh, a Roman citizen and they were followers of Caesar, then they were considered Caesarones. There was a extension, you, you took the first portion of that person's name and then there was a Latin word that was spelled I-A-N-I, Ani, Ani. And so therefore, if you were a follower of Caesar, they called you Caesar Anis. So after a period of time, as I was told, and as I read and studied, they dropped the I, off that I-A-N-I, they dropped the I and you have the I-A-N. So at this point in Acts chapter 11 in Antioch, they were first called Christians. So you have Christ in front, and because they were followers and disciples of Jesus, of Christ, they attached the I-A-N, which derived to Christians. They were first called Christians, followers of Christ, disciples of Christ in Antioch. So I'm sharing that uh, to say, as followers of Christ, as disciples of Christ, as Christians, those individuals would reflect Christ in their lives, in their actions. They would emulate Christ through their actions. They will reflect Christ, yes, reflect and emulate Christ in their walk, in their uh, living, um, in their speech and their manners and their conversation and all these different things, because now they were actually being called Christians, the followers of Christ, the disciples of Christ. Hence is where we get as if I say I am a uh, if I am an American comes from that same thought process, that same principle that A-N at the end. So I represent America. I represent as a Christian, Christ Jesus. So in representing Christ, in reflecting Christ, in being a follower of Christ, emulating Christ, what's going to happen? God, 
needs to refine us. The refining process becomes a part of our Christian walk. The word Christian, as it has been taught, as I've shared it, has been taught to me and has been taught by others. That word means to be Christ-like. So as a follower of Christ, as a disciple of Christ, as a Christian, to be Christ-like, in order to be Christ-like, we need the Holy Spirit to help us be, look like Christ, sound like Christ, act like Christ, emulate Christ, reflect Christ. And the help of the Holy Spirit, as the Bible tells us here, how does he do it? He refines us. He refines us. So when a person comes to God, they come to God, be it through a church service, through a Bible study, just through realization that I need to change my life. I want to give my life to Christ. I, I don't want to just go through a religion, have a religious experience and have a religious move. I really want to follow Christ. That's good. That's wonderful. It equates to salvation. I want to be saved. I want to be salvaged. That was the purpose. That was the reason Jesus came and gave his life was so that my soul, my life can and would be salvaged, spiritually salvaged. Not just my life, but everyone's life. Everyone would have that opportunity. Opportunity to live for God. And I like sharing it like that. And I like teaching that because I, I believe in my heart that God is giving us an opportunity as men and women, as believers in Christ to move away from religion and really begin to share what Christianity is so that it will be attractive to men and women because people go to church, people have a religious experience, have an emotional move, but are they? do they really look like Jesus? And I'm not saying that we are perfect, none of us are perfect, and we are striving towards perfection. And even in that, we are striving to be more like Jesus, the perfect one. So it takes work and it takes us allowing the Holy Spirit to help us get there. And he does that through the refining process, helping us to realize that there's none righteous, no, not one. But because of our humility and yielding and accepting of Jesus, the Holy Spirit is now able to help us look more like Jesus, even in the mistakes, even in the failures, even in all the ups and the downs of life, the Holy Spirit is there to help us navigate life and in navigating life, help us to look like Jesus because that becomes attractive to men and women. And what we do by default, by yielding to the Holy Spirit, what we're doing is lifting up Jesus. We're living John chapter 12, verse 32, without even knowing it or without even quoting the scripture. We're lifting up Jesus, not from a, a, a pulpit, not from a podium, but we're lifting up Jesus in our lives and by our lives, especially when there is a failure and then there is a turn to Jesus. People see the failure, but they also see us turn to Jesus and depend on Jesus. That is a spiritual magnet to draw men and women that to, to say that even though you're not perfect, even though uh, things have happened in your life, even though you've made bad decisions, the wrong decisions, whether they're intentionally or unintentionally, it shares with them, it shows them 
uh, of concerning a loving God, a merciful God, a gracious God, a God who says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you a rest. It shows men and women that God is not a religion. God is a reality. And in that reality, he loves them. He cares about them. He desires the best for them. So the Holy Spirit, John the Baptist going to uh, Matthew chapter three, notice what he said. And I kind of already laid it out for you. He said, I'm baptizing you. I'm the minister. You're the agent. The element is the water. I'm baptizing you in water unto repentance. But that's not refining you. That's an act, that's something that happens. You come up, you dry off, but there's nothing in you to help you as a result of that water. There's nothing in you to help you lift up Jesus. Water baptism, Peter wrote later in 1 Peter, that it's an outward profession, it's an outward show of what an, uh, of the inward work that should have already occurred, the acceptance of Jesus, the asking of forgiveness of sins. So the water baptism is an outward show for a clear conscience, all right? And I'm not saying not to be baptized, be baptized, it's, it's in the Bible. It, it, there people were baptizing, right? But now let's look at the other side. I baptize you unto water in water unto repentance, but there's one coming after me. His name is Jesus. He will also baptize you. Now he's the minister. You're still the agent. And the element is now the Holy Spirit. He's going to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. He's going to baptize you in power, into power. He's going to give you more than I could give you by baptizing you in water because Jesus said in John chapter 14, not only will he be with you, but he will also be in you. And the Holy Spirit in us, he's going to work on us work on us. Why? So that we will look like Jesus, so that we will strive to be more like Jesus, so that we will fulfill that word Christian to be Christ-like or followers of Jesus, disciples of Jesus. So John writing in Matthew chapter 11, verse 12, he said in the latter part of verse 11, he said, he shall baptize you in the Holy Spirit and with fire. So with the Holy Spirit comes that divine fire. And it's that divine fire that begins to burn or purge those natural impurities out of us so that we can look more like Jesus. What am I referring to when I say natural impurities? Hold your seat, buckle down, uh, fasten up your spiritual buckles as well as your physical buckles. Natural impurities, as I'm getting ready to share this, those negative attitudes that we sometimes have, those negative and bad thoughts that penetrate our mind and sometimes we harbor and we think about it. All those types of things, those harsh feelings, and all these other things, a long list, the Holy Spirit is in us to purge us of those things, and in purging us and burning those things out, that's the part of the refining process. Just like that piece of wood, you get it, it's raw. When we come to Jesus, we're raw. We're coarse. We're not perfect, we're, we're doing things, we're saved, but we're still doing things, maybe still uh, saying things, and, and that's okay, because the Holy Spirit comes into us, 
And this is what I, I, I try to teach men and women I have since I've been in the ministry when I became aware of it. Don't try to sanctify anyone. Let God sanctify them through the Holy Spirit because he's going to refine them. He's going to do what? Bring them to a finer state, a pure state. He's going to free them from all those spiritual impurities for what reason, what purpose, so they can look more like Jesus. And the Holy Spirit doesn't just do it in one preaching service. He does it throughout the entirety of that individual's Christian life. Through the entirety, once that person becomes a Christian, all the way from that point, all the way to the grave, the Holy Spirit is working on us, all right? So he's working on us. So in Matthew chapter three, verse 11 and 12, John the Baptist, he foretells us. So this was really prophetic in a sense, although it came to pass relatively quickly in a, in a three year span, because right after he was baptizing, or well, during the time he was baptizing in the river Jordan, Jesus approached them. As we read in John chapter one, Jesus approached him and them and John the Baptist looked and he said, behold, the lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. And he began to have a conversation with Jesus. He said, I have need to be baptized of you. So this came to pass relatively soon after a few years after he actually makes this statement. But it was the refining process was foretold or it was prophesied by John. He said, Jesus is going to baptize you in the Holy Spirit and with fire. And the Holy Spirit, he has his fan in his hand. What does that mean? So in order uh, for fire to burn, it needs oxygen, right? And the more oxygen that's applied to uh, a fire, it begins to uh, uh, burn hotter. For example, if you start a fire in a fireplace, and there's a vent on top of the fireplace, if you close that vent, it's going to go out. If you open that vent and allow oxygen to pass through it, it's going to burn hotter and hotter. So back in the days, not, not today, as we look at fireplaces or have fireplaces, they used to have, and I don't know what they're called, but it was these um, um, items where you would just kind of um, like an accordion type of deal and you would press that and it would blow oxygen uh, into that fire and hence it would heat up. Even out when I was in the military, when we were doing survival training, when we were to start a fire, then we would kind of fan it, right? Once you start a little fire with some um, pine needles, then you would have to fan it to get that oxygen in there and the flame will start getting larger and larger. So that's what he's referring to here in Matthew chapter three, verse 12, where he says his fan is in his hand. So the Holy Spirit is in us and he has that fire to do what? To begin to purify us, to purify us because he wants us to look like Jesus and the more we look like Jesus, we draw men and women to Jesus. Again, not just from our voice, not just from our position, not just from our titles. I, I often, I deal with that, and I, I've been saying that for the last couple, two, three years, um, because so many people, especially in ver various cultures, ethnic cultures, we get so caught up brothers and sisters with titles. We get so caught up with degrees. We get so caught up with clothes. We get so caught up. They're driving this. They live in that neighborhood. They have this degree or that degree, or they have this money and that. And what concern is that to God? God is trying to refine every man, every woman, so that we can look more like Jesus and in looking more like Jesus, then we're going to draw other men and women because Jesus came and the Bible says God so loved the world. He doesn't care about your status. He doesn't care about your wealth or lack thereof. He doesn't care about your education or lack thereof. 
What are we doing for Jesus? We can use those things as tools to promote Jesus. We can use education. We can use wealth. We can use status. We can use popularity to lift up Jesus. But even in using it, God's still going to refine us. Because in that refining process, we're going to become better men, better women for God as well as for our families, better husbands, better wives, better better uh, associates, better uh, comrades or whatever, better friends because of the refining process. I heard years ago, probably about 1990 and I use it, so I'm not the originator of this statement. The greatest room in our lives is the room for improvement. The greatest room. If I'm pastoring a church, still the greatest room in my life is the room for improvement. If I'm the president of, of a country, still the greatest room in my life is the room for improvement. If I acquire five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 doctor degrees and all these different things, still the greatest room is the room of improvement. Because for the Christian, for the follower of Christ, for the disciple of Jesus, our goal in this life, yes, is to make it to heaven, but until we get there, is to look more like Jesus. And it takes the Holy Spirit refining us. It takes the Holy Spirit working on us. So with the Holy Spirit working on us, we have to allow him to work on us. We have to yield to him. Notice what David said, Psalm 139. Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. I label the, these couple scriptures, I put them in, one, in a thought. Permission for divine refining or a request to be refined. David said it this way. David said, search me. Oh God, David was requesting God in so many words to refine him. He was giving God permission to start the refining process in him. He uttered the words, search me, oh God. In so many words, walk up and down the corridors of my heart. Search me, oh God. And do what? Know my heart. Giving God access to our hearts. Humbly yielding to God. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Lord, I don't know everything in my heart. You say, well, I know my heart. Well, sometimes situations come up. Circumstances arise. Adverse situations, adverse circumstances. Do you know how you're going to respond? Do you know how you're going to feel emotionally? Do you know what words will come out of your mouth? If someone makes you upset in that moment? Or how have you been dealing with something over an extended period of time? Especially us Christians. Let's talk about us Christians. Well, I've been praying about that, praying about that, praying about that for a long time. Well, keep praying about it. Or are you now getting the attitude and say, God's not going to do it. So David said, search me, oh God, and I want you to know my heart. Now, the Bible tells us God is omniscient. He already knows, right? But notice in this request for refining, search me, oh God, and know my heart. Try me. That word try, interpreted from the from the Hebrew text, as well as the he uh, Greek text in the New Testament, Hebrew text in the Old Testament. He says, try me, it means to test. So David is saying, Lord, search me that you may know my heart. I also want you to test me. I want you to try me and know my thoughts because one's thoughts can shift in the heat of the battle, when we're tested. 
I hear people, I've heard people from time to time say, oh, I would do this and I would do that. And I say, you're, you're not in the, you're not being tried. You're not in the test. It's not what you say you'll do before the test, before the trial. It's when you're in the test, when you're in the trial, what will you think? What will your actions be? How will your attitude be? So David is giving God permission and he's making a request of God to refine him. Search me, oh God. Have you prayed that prayer? Are you even courageous enough to pray that prayer? Every, a lot of people want to live a Christian life. A lot of people want to serve God. A lot of people want to do all those things, but are you willing to pray? Excuse me just a moment. Are you willing to say, search me, oh God, and know my heart? Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me. Because in the midst of the testing, in the midst of the trying, what's gonna happen? The impurities are gonna to come to the top. So the Holy Spirit, let me just circle around. The Holy Spirit in us, David was saying, all right, the spirit is in me. He's gonna refine me. How's he going to refine me? He's going to apply fire. There's gonna be some adverse circumstances. There are gonna be some misunderstandings. Uh, there's gonna be times where everyone doesn't see it my way. There's gonna be some times of failure. How will I think at those times? How will I respond at those times? When I walk around the house, will everyone in my house know I'm a Christian? Will everyone on the job know that I'm a Christian? Will all my family members know that I'm serving Jesus because I'm walking through the valley? It's a question that we ask ourselves. Search me, oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me because there's no wicked way in Jesus. There's no wickedness in Jesus. And I say, I'm a Christian. I'm Christ-like. I'm a follower of Christ. I'm a disciple of Christ. But in the midst of the battle, in the midst of the trial, during the testing period, do we still reflect Jesus? Do we still respond like Jesus? Do people still see Jesus? Refine me, God. The Holy Spirit uses fire and his fan is in his hand and he's gonna thoroughly, completely purge his floor. When fire, if you've ever seen any type of like mineral, they put it in a pot. Let's just say gold, because we're going to get to that scripture in First Peter. They put gold in a pot, just a bunch of gold in a pot, and they apply fire to it, to that, that pot. I'm using, it's called a certain thing. And they applied more and more wood to the fire to make it hotter and hotter and hotter. Why? Because what happens, the hotter it gets, the more fire, the hotter the fire gets, what happens to that gold or silver or bronze or any uh, uh, mineral? The impurities began to separate. And the, purity, the impurities go to the top. And as the, uh, the impurities ascend to the top, what do they do? They just scrape it off, right? And they apply more fire, right? Because the more impurities they scrape off, the purer the product is. So they, they continue to apply more fire, more heat 
to the gold and more impurities rise to the top and then they scrape it off. And then at some point they're satisfied and they say, this is pure gold or pure gold, pure gold. Brothers and sisters, that's the same principle that the Holy Spirit does in our lives. There's a purpose for refining. Let's see it. Let's read it here. First Peter chapter two, verse seven. He said, knowing the trial or the test of your faith being much more precious than gold that I just described to you because gold perish, but not our faith, brothers and sisters. For he said in Hebrews chapter 12, he said in verse two, looking unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher. He's the beginner and the ending of our faith. We're in the middle and it's in the middle we get tested. It's the same thing in Psalm 22, 23, and 24. Psalm 22 is symbolic to Mount Calvary or salvation dealing with Jesus. Psalm 24, so you have this mountaintop, of Psalm 22, Calvary, I get saved. I'm a follower of Jesus, I'm a disciple of Christ. And I look across the valley and I see Psalm 24, which represents Mount Zion, which represents heaven. So we go from Psalm 22, I'm saved, I'm on my way to Psalm 24, Mount Zion, heaven. It's not that simple because in between Psalm 22 and Psalm 24, there's what? Psalm 23 in the valley. So in order to get from Psalm 22 to Psalm 22, four, one mountaintop to the next, you have to go through the valley. Hence, David said, yea, though I walk through the valley. So I'm on this mountain and I want to get to that mountain. I got to go down through the valley and I got to walk through the valley and it's in the valley. I'm going to be tested. It's in the valley where that uh, I'm going to be tried. It's in the valley where that fire, it's in the valley where those impurities those unlike those Christ, unlike Christ-like impurities, well, unlike those spiritual impurities, let me say it that way, are going to rise to the surface. So as we're walking through the valley, the Holy Spirit in us, he's going to apply the heat. And the more heat he applies, it's going to bring those impurities to the top. We recognize those impurities. As David says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me. Verse 24, he said, and lead me in the way of everlasting. So even though we're in the valleys, brothers and sisters, the Holy Spirit is still there. He's refining us. He's applying the fire, but he's leading us. He's leading us through the valley, right? Because in that leading us, he's able to scrape off those impurities as we are on our way to Psalm 24. We're on our way to heaven and, and we're looking more like Jesus. And on that journey, on that walk, fighting those battles, having those testings, we are lifting up Jesus. We are emulating Jesus. We are reflecting to Jesus to all those other people, all those family members, all those coworkers, all those uh, friends. Uh, we're showing them Jesus in the valley. We're showing them hope in their valley. We're showing them that, no, I'm not perfect, but it's through God I'm forgiven and the Holy Spirit, yes, he's refining me, um, but I'm on my way to heaven. So it gives them hope. It gives them hope. So our refining process, notice what he said in Peter. He said, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 7. He says, the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus. So though your faith, be it in your marriage, be it with your children, be it on the job, God knows where you are. I'm just speaking generally, be it with relationships. Though it's being tried and you don't understand it and you can't figure it out and you're asking God intervene and it doesn't seem like that divine intervention is there. Just hold out, hold out. God will never leave you. God will never forsake you. 
God is right there. God is on your side. Though your faith is being tried uh, with fire, know that God is refining you. God, I mean, we hear it, and I, I don't want to try to be like a lot of these preachers. You know, God is trying to do something in you, but God, that's what he's really trying to do. He's really trying to do something in us and through us because the Bible says this. So that's how it'll be different. I'll add some scripture to it so you can refer back to the scripture. Uh, the scripture says, be confident, Philippians chapter one, verse six, verse eight, one of the two, be confident in this very thing that he who hath begun a good work in you, he shall continue it. So as we're going from Psalm 22, walking through the valley on our path, on our road, to Psalm 24, know that this refining process, this fire, this trial, this adverse circumstance, this adverse situation that we don't understand, it's God is doing what? God is working it together for our good. What else is happening? What else? What's the other purpose? We are lifting up Jesus. We're lifting up Jesus when you fail. When you make a mistake, when you trip, when you stumble and you turn to God and say, you know what, God, forgive me. You're lifting up Jesus because men and women, they see that he's not perfect. She's not perfect, but they do know God. God is there for them. They know how to turn to God. Brothers and sisters, we read throughout the Bible. We read David. We read of his mishaps. We read Abraham's mishaps. We read of Moses' mishaps. We read of Peter's mishaps. We read of Paul's mishaps. Why does God allow us to see their failures as well as their successes? Because God shows us that they are human, just like you and I. And God shows us that the Holy Spirit is in them and refining them, just like he's in us and refining us. So God, through the word of God, this is the importance of looking at the word of God, coming to Bible studies, asking those questions so that we can get clear understanding, clear understanding of what God is doing, not trying to do. People say God is trying to do this. No, we understand what God is doing, not what he's trying to do. He's God. He can do it. What God is doing in us. Hence, this is where we open up other scriptures and the pieces of the puzzle of the Bible become clear, not just religion, but a reality. Proverbs 3, 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding. Just acknowledge him and he will direct your path through Psalm 23. He's directing our path through Psalm 23. Why do we know that? Because we stand on the promises of God. Jesus came and died on the cross for us, not for us to be lost, but for us to be saved. Jesus summarized it. And he said in John chapter 14, verse one, he said, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. He said, in my father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. He said, I am going to prepare a place for you so that where I am, ye may be also. Yes, you're going to walk through the valley of the shadow of death and just know that it's not death. It's just a shadow because I've already gone to prepare a place for you so that where I am, ye may be also. Yes, the Holy Spirit in that same chapter, he said, I will not leave you comfortless. He said, I will send the Holy Spirit and he shall be in you. He shall be with you. He shall refine you. He shall help you look more like me because it's not just about us. It's also about us reflecting Jesus. It's about us emulating Jesus. It's about us reaching other people who were like us and give them hope as we were given hope through Christ. So this divine refining process is for our good and the good of all those God allows us to be around. Refined by God, brothers and sisters, is continual. None of us have arrived. Again, let me emphasize, it doesn't matter what your title is. I'm a pastor. I'm an assistant pastor. I'm a Sunday school teacher. I'm a this. 
people get caught up in all that. And the only thing that comes to the surface on that is pride, which is an impurity, right? It comes to the surface, it, it rises, and all of a sudden they're walking around like this. I'm this and I'm that. Well, you didn't die on the cross for nobody. You didn't go to hell for nobody. Until you do that, then we are nothing or should be nothing in our sight and all glory should go to God because it's through that refining process of the Holy Spirit, we are better. We go from good to better. Good satisfies the average, but I want to be better because better means that's an ongoing, continual work. I haven't arrived, so I'm going to keep praying. I'm going to keep studying. I'm going to keep asking the Holy Spirit, search me, oh God, and know my heart so I can be a better Christian, so I can be a better husband, so I can be a better father, so I can be a better minister. I need you to lead me and guide me and help me. God, you need God to lead you and guide you so you and I, we can have that better relationship. We can have better relationships because it's in our relationships. Brothers and sisters, we give people an opportunity to know Christ and to see Christ. As I close here, the purpose of refining is for spiritual purity, spiritual growth, reflecting Jesus. And let me close here with dealing with purity. He said in Matthew chapter eight, he said, blessed are the pure in heart. Matthew 5, 8, blessed are the pure in heart. How do we become pure? It's through the refining process of the Holy Spirit. And blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Jesus summarized it right there in the Beatitudes. Blessed are the pure in heart. How do you become pure in heart? It's through the refining process, that divine refining process where we have to allow God. We have to request God to do so, give him permission and yield to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, his fan is in his hand and he's wanting to purge, not to hurt us, not to harm us, but to move us from a good state to a better state a state of continuous excelling, continuous lifting of Jesus in our lives. Brothers and sisters, our family members are depending on us. They really are. They're depending on us. I'm going to phrase it this way. We're spiritual role models. We are spiritual role models. When we named the name of Jesus and became Christians, followers of Christ, disciples of Christ, we became spiritual role models, leading men and women to Jesus. Don't get stuck on, I know a number of people get stuck on, well, I'm not a minister and I'm not this. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. He goes into verse 18. He says, as ye have been reconciled, ye have been restored. You also, all those in verse 17, he says, I've also given you the ministry of reconciliation. So every one of us, we have the ministry of reconciliation by default. And then he closes that chapter out in verse 20. He says, and we are ambassadors for Jesus he wasn't specific to a pastor, assistant pastor, evangelist. He wasn't specific. He says, all those who are in Christ, who are new creatures, they're also all ambassadors for Christ. We reflect Christ. We reflect, we emulate Christ. We, brothers and sisters, God is looking to you and I, the church, to allow him to refine us so that we may fulfill the great commission, which is go into all the world and reach men and women for Jesus. Let them know how much he loves them, even as he loved us and all our faults and all our failures. It's a part of the Adamic curse, if you please, that natural man 
God still loves them like he loves us. He says he's not a respecter of persons. So let us deliver that message. We delivered the message of Isaiah 53 last week. Let us deliver the message of hope. Let us continuously in our lives, in our walk, be refined by God so that Jesus will resonate in us and through us to humanity. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Son, Jesus. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your love and your faithfulness. I thank you, Lord.